Hey guys, Robin here, and welcome to another movie review. Now, previous, <clears throat> now previously, you you saw me review the 1988 remake of the 1950s classic, The Blob. But what you may not know, prior to seeing the title for this video, <clears throat> is that in 1972. The Blob actually got a sequel titled Son of Blob, also known as Beware the Blob. Now, I personally feel that not a lot of that not enough people talk about this movie. Because whenever someone talks about Blob, it's it's always the fifties it's always the fifties blob or the eighties blob, but no one talks about the nineteen seventy two sequel. Which, by the way, the, which, by the way, the sequel was directed by J.R. Ewing himself, Larry Hagman, who also has a small role in the film, <clears throat> as does as do most of the people featured here. But yeah, we got like an ensemble cast from again, from again, Larry Hagman, Cindy Williams, Dick Van Patten, uh, Shelley Berman, Burgess Meredith. Cal Winley and Godfrey Cambridge. <clears throat> now, by the way, God Godfrey Cambridge's character, Shafter Hargis, <clears throat> she now um, now as you may or may not know, uh, spoiler alert, when I go like this, you can unmute. To those of you that haven't muted, at the the, the 1950s blob ends with the blob being transported to the Arctic to the Arctic, where it is frozen. <clears throat> Welcome back to those who didn't want spoilers. <clears throat> so, although, um, now, some versions of the film actually do show it happen, li like they show how the character, how Godfrey Cambridge's character got the blob, but that scene is omitted from this print, but that... <clears throat> But it's not that big of an issue because he because he exposits to his wife how he got a sample of the blob. <clears throat> and um, now uh, now of course now the, of course he uh, takes the now now the blob is in kind of a thermos that he takes out of the freezer and he forgot and and. <clears throat> and being a character in a cheesy 70s sci-fi movie, <clears throat> he forgets to put it back, and the blob pops the top off of the thermos that it's in. <clears throat> and um, and the very first uh, victim that, that the blob uh, kills in this movie is a fly that lands on it, and you see it sink in. But the fly isn't sinking into it, the blob is absorbing it. And animal lovers be and uh, cat lovers beware, the blob's next victim is a kitten. And I guess to make you extra sad about this kitten, this kitten is seen frolicking around in grass and flowers all over the movie's opening credits. <clears throat> yeah. Now, although Godfrey Cambridge um, it's the guy who bought the blob back. Fortunately, this movie doesn't play, it doesn't play the, uh, black dude dies first trope, trope straight. In that, um, <clears throat> although just barely, because the person, because the blob's first human victim is still a person of, it's still a person of color, namely Chester's wife, whose name I can't remember. After the blob absorbs the fly and the cat, she's out there looking for the cat. Which, by the way, the cat's name is apparently Samuel. Like, who named the cat Sam? Well, I'm Samuel. But anyway, she's out there looking for the cat, and the blob rolls up behind her, attacking the killer tomato style. And it basically uh, gets one of her legs, gets her other leg. And, and then we see the blob start crawling up her legs, which is which is a which is a very creepy shot. 
which is a creepy shot. And then, <clears throat> and um, and uh, Chester is next in line, which you may, which, which um, if you've seen like a clip of a of a girl with long black hair and a red shirt screaming, <clears throat> and then a close up on her right before she screams, then a close up on a black guy surrounded by on a black guy completely covered by what appears to be strawberry jam, he got a little bit of it on his face, that is from this movie. Yeah. <clears throat> now, uh, <clears throat> uh, now, as far as plot goes, um, the best I can sum it up is after this girl, is um, after this girl, mm, is that after this girl, Lisa Clark, Played by Gwen Guilford, spots the spots the blob eating Chester. She she the rest of the movie is basically her trying to convince people there's a blob and it's eating people. <clears throat> there's a blob and it's eating people. We have to find out a way to stop it. <clears throat> but you but before you ask yourself, well, in the original movie the blob was defeated with with like fire extinguishers. So, why don't they just try freezing it from the get-go? <clears throat> well, that's because... Well, that is because, um... Well, that's because Chester is the one who found the blob frozen, and the only person he told... <clears throat> and the only person he told of the blob's frozen... And the only, the only person he tells of the blob's weakness to cold is his wife, uh, who is killed by the blob before she can pass the information on before she can pass the information on to anybody else. Now, there are multiple scenes in this movie that feature, that introduce characters only for them to get killed by the blob. Like there's two hippies being obnoxious in a drainage pipe and this, and this biker car wants to give them a hard time. However, the biker cop gets killed by the blob, <clears throat> and there's also just a different person with long brown hair dealing with a very, very sarcastic and snarky barber. <clears throat> he, he, he decides to wash the guy's hair before he snips it, but as he is getting the guy's hair all nice and shampooed and soapy, the blob completely fills up the sink, and somehow the barber doesn't notice until he dunks the guy's head right in it, and the blob latches onto his arm. And there is, um, now, but there, of course there are scenes that introduce new characters that don't get killed. For example, there's this one guy, there's this naked fat guy, there's a scene with a naked fat guy in a bathtub, don't worry, you don't see anything from the gut down. Because, because again, it's a seventies movie. They couldn't really show, they couldn't really show a guy's wang. <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> now he, uh, for some reason, the guy's wearing a fez in the bathtub. Now, if you don't know, um, a fez it, it's just um, it's a silk, it's a cylindrical hat, it's a cylindrical hat that has like a black tassel kind of coming down. You might often see um, they're 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 very commonly worn by Shriners, and the character's name is never mentioned. He's just credited as the Naked Turk. But anyway, um, he spots the blob like a, like seeping under his bathroom door. He throws a shoe at it. It gets stuck in the blob. His little dog tries to get the shoe out, and the guy the guy gets close. Well, and the guy throws a phone through a window, which, by the way, is it, it actually a really well done shot, because, I mean, you can tell that kind of what they did is, <clears throat> he, he is, they had the camera pointing up at the sky, they put a pane of glass, they put a pane of glass just above the camera, <clears throat> and they dropped the phone through the pane of glass, which, it's a really good looking shot, and, um, and of course, later the guy runs down the street shouting for help. 
he gets uh, picked up by a cop who does not believe his cockamamie story and arrests him for indecent exposure, even though he was running down a street in the middle of the night and there was absolutely no one else around. But then again, I'm not a lawyer, so what the hell do I know about laws? <coughs> now, <coughs> now, uh, now, earlier I mentioned that Larry Hagman has a small role. <coughs> he, there's one scene where we see a trio of hobos. Uh, the younger one is played by Larry Hagman. The older one is played by Burgess Meredith. And the third hobo wearing an eye patch. <clears throat> it's actually played by Del Close, who actually went on to portray Reverend Meeker in the 1988 remake, which is really cool. Which is uh, really cool. And, um, and, uh, yeah, and, um, yeah, and Larry, yeah. So yeah, there's a bunch of hobos basically singing, doing whatever, going off about about random stuff when they hear the blob attacking a chicken coop, attacking a chicken coop, and uh, the cop played by the, ho the the cop, the hobo played by Larry Hagman goes to see what's going on, only to become a victim of the blob. <clears throat> and Del Close and Burgess Meredith come to his aid. <clears throat> Del Close is armed with a pitchfork, and uh, Burgess Meredith is armed with a glass of alcohol or whatever. Which, by the way, you don't see, you don't see like the blob doing its thing to them, but you do see see the the shadow of it happening. Which is really cool, I mean, like, again, this movie didn't have much of a budget, but they found a lot of, like, really c creative ways to work around the budget. Yeah. <clears throat> now, now, whereas the original Blob and the 80s Blob both have the, they both have, their big scene is when the Blob attacks a movie theater. However, in Son of Blob, there isn't any movie theater, theater to be seen. Instead, <clears throat> instead, the establishment the Blob attacks is a bowling alley. Which, by the way, which, by the way, um, if you are aware of this movie, that might also be a shot you see of like a bunch of like a bowling alley, <clears throat> and then a huge red blob comes out absorbing the bowling pins, and. You, and as it kind of like floods down the bowling alley, you can kind of see see the pins like like spinning around if you're inside the blob, which is really cool. In fact, um, the blob in this movie, um, a lot of the blob was what are uh, used. The thing they used like to create the blob was uh, strawberry jam, believe it or not, <clears throat> and um, and by the way, when the blob attacks the uh, chickens, um, you can tell that what the blob is, um, it's just, like, something that is rotating, because you see, you see the same texture over and over again, yeah, and, um, yeah, now, you may also be interested in, into, like, as to, how, as to how this movie came to be, well, there's a very fascinating story behind that, and I would like to share that story, you see, because, you see, the enormous success of The Blob led producer Jack H. Harris to try and do a sequel. Richard Clare had already written a script titled A Ship Off the Old Blob. Which, by the way, which, by the way, like, how... Which, which by the way, that is just a masterful title. But the project had been shelved for many years. But in late 1970, Harris's son, Anthony Harris, who had just graduated from USC and was working with a music publishing company, <clears throat> expressed interest in working with his father, looking for a project. They both agreed to, to the Blob sequel. Now, Harris just happened to live right next door to Larry Hagman, who would go on to play J.R. Ewing in Dallas. <clears throat> However, However, Hagman had never seen the original The Blob, 
and since this was the early 1970s, and since this was the early 1970s, he couldn't exactly pop a DVD copy of The Blob into uh, a VCR. He, as a matter of fact, VHS didn't come around until 1976, four, four years after this movie came out. <clears throat> but, so, at the time, the only way to watch movies at home was you had to have a film wheel of the movie, a projector, and a wall or seat in your house wide enough to project it on, white enough to project the movie on. How I, so, so Harris show, showed Hagman his personal 16mm print of the film, and he showed such interest, Hagman told Harris he would be able to assemble his friend for the cast, as he felt everyone wanted to be blobbed, but only on the condition that he would direct the picture. Now, when this movie came out, it was a it was a failure, and it faded into obscurity <clears throat> until <clears throat> until the summer of 1980. <clears throat> because you see, on March 21st, 1980, the season three finale of the uh, season finale of Dallas ha had J.R. Ewing get shot by an unknown assailant, and this was a huge, huge deal at the time. Like, this was at the same level as who did Negan kill with his baseball bat in the season finale of The Walking Dead, the difference is, there wasn't a comic book to draw prior evidence from. <clears throat> and by the way, um, when the uh, following season premiere revealed who the killer was, it was the second most watched TV, TV thing of all time, of all time, <clears throat> of all time, and it was the number one most viewed uh, TV episode, TV show episode in history until the series finale of of the TV show Mash. But anyway, um, but anyway, um, going off on a tangent there. Anyways, while the world was going crazy over who shot Jr., Larry Hagman actually re-released the movie <clears throat> into theaters, into theaters that. Now with the tagline, the movie that J.R. shot, and uh, yeah, and the movie developed a cult following, although nowhere near as big of a cult following as the 50s blob, and like, it's just like not, I mean, like, and, and like, you almost never see anyone talk about this movie, like, it's always like, it's only small-time movie, movie reviewers like me that give, that give weird, obscure movies like this any kind of, uh, press, I guess. So, yeah, and by the way, this, and by the way, the entire movie is on YouTube, and I will include a link down in the description. Now, one final thing to note about this movie, um, now, it does have kind of, um, it has a very, uh, percussion-heavy, uh, uh, score because, um, a, um, because quite often you'll hear, like, drums, it's, it's basically kind of like, you'll hear, like, drums and when the, uh, blob attacks someone, you might hear the blaring of a wind instrument. But yeah, but yeah, so if you're, if you're interested, so if you've already seen the 50s blob and the 80s blob, and you want more blob, and or you're, you're a fan of CD 70s driving creature features like this one, I can wholly recommend this movie, and even if you fit in, into none of that category, like, like, like you, like, let's say you prefer, like, let's say you prefer, the latest CGI Splooge Fest from Marvel, I would still recommend uh, this one. So yeah, Son of Blob, a very decent 70s cheese fest that, did, that gets nowhere near 
the amount of attention it should be getting. But yeah, I do recommend this one, and that concludes this review. So, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all soon in the near future. Peace. Peace. Peace.